Hello, welcome back. Today I'd like to give an introduction and overview of machine learning and neural networks. Now it's a gigantic topic in modern research and technology and computer science, so I want to talk about what we're going to cover in this uh, video, in this lesson. Now when you think of machine learning and neural networks, the image that comes to mind is a bunch of interconnected lines with circles and nodes, and we call them neurons, and there's inputs and there's outputs, and it's a very complicated spaghetti looking mess. About half of this lesson will be uh, dedicated to understanding what that means. And not just from a point and talk point of view, from a mathematical point of view. So the back end of the lesson will be basically mathematics to understand that. But I promise you, it doesn't go beyond high school algebra. Uh, I will break it down in small enough bite-sized chunks that anybody can understand how a neural network is put together. And in the beginning of this lesson, before we get to that part, I would like to talk about applications of neural networks, what a lot of modern research how they have arrived at the techniques that they're using, and sort of kind of a survey of modern uh, techniques and systems in neural networks. Again, gigantic topic, and this is an introduction and an overview. It is not designed to be a full course in this topic, but it's a good springboard for you to take off from here and learn more. All right, let's start at the beginning. Let's start at the fun part. What is uh, what are the applications of these topics? Uh, machine learning, neural networks, artificial intelligence. Really, I could go on and on about this all day long. We'll just hit the most important applications in today's world. The biggest ones, I would say, probably are image recognition uh, and also speech recognition. Now, those two things are used in lots and lots of industries by themselves. So let's pick it apart and we'll give some examples of additional ways in which neural networks are being used today. All right, image recognition. What do I mean by that? You see, humans are very, very good at recognizing classification of, of items. If I show you two images of a pen, here's an image of a pen right here, and then here is another image of a pen. Now, obviously, these two images look different, but you know as a human that it has all of the characteristics and attributes of something that we call a pen, right? So that's what we call image recognition. Even when two images are not identical or even very close, being able to classify them uh, in, a, in a known structure. All right, here is an image of uh, two numbers. Here's a number three, and here is another number three. Now, obviously, these two numbers look completely different, but they we uh, have a, no problem understanding that even children have no problem understanding that these represent the same symbol, but they look very different. Trying to program a computer to look at two very different things and classify them in the same way is very hard to do without modern techniques and neural networks and machine learning. Right, another example, here's an image of a car, and here is another image of a car. They look totally different, right? But they are both images of a car. What are you looking for in, in, in these images? Well, you know cars have four wheels, you know the general shape, you know uh, there's a pointy end and there's a not so pointy end, you know where the glass is, you know where the mirrors are, you can also judge the size of it, and through experience and seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of cars, you've built a model up as to what that should look like, so even though you're not given two identical images, you can still classify them in the same way. We do that with faces, with signs, with letters, and grouping the letters into words, and the words into sentences, and so on. So, image recognition, huge part of machine learning. All right, another big area of machine learning, speech recognition, right? Um, speech recognition, when I speak, you know, when I was a kid, computers couldn't understand voice at all. Now, computers can understand my voice pretty well. Not perfect, but pretty well. Right? So let me give you an example of speech recognition. So I'm going to embarrass myself here a little bit. Let me say a phrase in my normal Texan United States accent. Okay? I'd like a cup of tea. I would like a cup of tea. I'd like a cup of tea. But a British person might say it, you know, and this is embarrassing, right? I'd like a cup of tea. May I have a cup of tea? Right? Now, my British accent is terrible, so you can just laugh. That's fine. I'm not, I'm not British. But you see the difference. I'd like a cup of tea. I would like a cup of tea. They're totally different sounding, but we know and we have learned to interpret the differences, to classify the differences in certain buckets, and we understand that they're the same thing, even though they actually sound very different. And you can have, of course, other languages and similar examples in other languages. So, speech recognition, image recognition, just two examples in a huge array of examples. Now, let's go a little bit farther. 
cutting edge research in uh, industry, government research labs, also uh, many companies, self-driving cars, right? To be able to get into a vehicle, to tell it to go to a destination, and for it to drive you to the destination. That is an incredibly difficult task, right? Because in order to do self-driving uh, technology, the vehicle needs to be able to see the world around it, and it needs to be able to do massive amounts of image recognition, and very, very quickly. Because as the car moves, the scene changes. You're moving through the scene, so the angles through which you see everything is always changing. And so that image recognition process has to happen very, very fast. Right? Uh, from different angles, the way things look in different angles and so on. The vehicle needs to understand all of the different cars around it and see the different cars, but also pedestrians, uh, people walking across the street. What about people pushing a stroller with a baby carriage across the street? What about somebody walking a dog across the street? What about somebody riding a horse across the street? What about somebody driving a giant dump truck across the street? What about somebody carrying golf clubs across the street? You see, they all sound uh, uh, very, very uh, similar to us. We all know what that concept is. But to a computer, someone carrying golf clubs, pushing a cart, uh, jumping, uh, running, skipping, they're all different. So we have to have a way to have it classify with great accuracy these different situations in order to be able to drive. And then, of course, the car has to be able to, to actually control the vehicle safely, too, and not crash into anything. That's a whole other part of it as well. All right, let's go into a different area. What are other applications of uh, neural networks? Medical imaging. So when a, a radiologist or another doctor looks at a medical image, some sort of scan, and they're looking for tumors, cancerous tumors, broken bones, things like this, sometimes they're very, very hard to identify, and it takes a trained doctor that look, has looked at thousands or hundreds of thousands of these images to be able to spot these very small uh, problems that we can have inside of us, you know, tumors and things like this. But if we train a computer on millions and millions of images, they can get very, very good at, at identifying things in images that could be a problem. So medical imaging, very important. Security and surveillance, teaching a computer how to look for things that are out of place in a parking lot uh, and flag the authorities or inside of a, of a store for uh, maybe theft prevention or something like this training a computer to look for things out of the ordinary, that's machine learning, right? Example that you probably used, Google Translate. So, you know, years ago, to translate images or to translate languages, you would, of course, learn the language, but there were books and there were computer programs to kind of help you. But nowadays, you can just go to Google Translate, type it in, or even speak to it what you'd like to say, and it will translate to the other language. And you might say, well, that's not artificial intelligence, language is just translating one word to another word. But if you've ever learned a foreign language, you know that's not true. Because you can combine the words differently to have different meanings. And the way the computer for Google learns how to do that properly is by learning from millions of conversations in various languages. So it's not a straight conversion from word to word, it is a a, a syntax, a, a, a meaning that is a, a sometimes a little bit different or a little bit difficult to get without vast, vast amount of learning from the computer. What about healthcare? Predicting patient outcomes from the hospital. A, a computer system might be able to look at millions of records and determine with a high probability someone's going to have problems after they're discharged uh, if they have these certain symptoms by looking at that and predict patient outcomes, maybe to help treatment plans, things like this, uh, risk factors for diseases, cancer diagnosis, and so on. What about finance? You have fraud transactions, credit cards. When you are using your credit card in a different location for a different type of purchase, then machine learning or artificial intelligence on the side of the bank can flag it as a fraudulent transaction. Even though they don't know, they're just looking for for patterns out of the ordinary to flag it. And how do they get the patterns? By looking at millions of transactions and basically uh, determining what would be likely for you to purchase, and then flagging it when that's not the case. Under finance, what about the stock market, market trends, investing? There are uh, neural networks and machine learning uh, algorithms being in use today to try to make money, of course. Transportation. Optimizing fuel routes for airlines and cars, delivery of packages. When you have uh, 50 cities and a thousand trucks, there's like billions of ways to maneuver them around to deliver things, but machine learning can make that process more efficient, save on fuel, right? 
energy for the power grid. Power grid, a lot of it is controlled by machine learning, believe it or not, because they can study when the power is needed, the machine learning can study when the power is needed and when it isn't and automatically uh, supply more power or maybe not burn as much fuel during these periods. Or maybe predict ahead of time how the weather, weather might um, interact or affect the power grid. And finally, in edu education, that would be the holy grail if uh, machine learning could uh, determine what your weaknesses are and then teach you problems and skills to build upon your weaknesses. In other words, everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. Maybe you don't need to focus so much on the strengths, you get bored. Maybe you focus on the weaknesses in just the right way to make you understand better. So that was a basic overview of the applications of machine learning. So what I'd like to do now is dive a little bit into what is the difference between the term artificial intelligence uh, and then compare that to the term machine learning and then compare that to the term neural network. We're gonna do that and then after that, we'll dive into a neural network to help you understand how it works. All right, now we've all heard the terms artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks. How are they related to each other? So there's a hierarchy. At the very top of the hierarchy is what we call artificial intelligence, AI. Everybody's heard of AI, right? So I'll write it on the board, but I'm not gonna write a lengthy definition for it because I think we all know generally what AI is supposed to be, right? It is, broadly speaking, it's an algorithm or a system for performing tasks, either computational tasks or robotics type tasks in the real world, usually that are uh, a, a superior, uh, humans do a superior job with, but we want to do it with computers without human intervention. Now, of course, it's pattern recognition. Uh, it, it is uh, decision making. It is uh, uh, object recognition, things like that. But the main thing is that the general umbrella of artificial intelligence, it doesn't have to be with a feedback loop of machine learning. In the early days of artificial intelligence, the way they tried to do it is make very complex decision trees. I mean, you can program artificial intelligence through hard-coded programming. But if you think about it, it's, it's just incredibly impossible to make really good headway in that direction. For instance, if we think about the realm of self-driving cars again, since that's a modern application of AI, you theoretically could write a program, you know, if you see a person, stop. If you see a red light, stop. If you see a green light, go. If you see a yellow light, you have to decide. If you turn left, do this. If you turn right, do this. If this, if this, if this, if this. It's gonna be impossible because there are so many combinations of what can happen with the weather, with traffic. What if a squirrel runs out? What if a horse runs out? What if a meteor comes down? What if a tree branch is in the road? We can't realistically write programs with enough decision points to make it really work. But of course, people have tried. So artificial intelligence can be hard coded, but the modern techniques for artificial intelligence generally are not done that way because they kind of lead to dead ends or, or programs that don't work too well and they're not very flexible. But the broad category of AI, that's what it is, algorithms, or systems to perform tasks that traditionally could only be done with a human, all right? Now, a subset of artificial intelligence is what we call machine learning. So under that, I'm gonna write under that as like a subset. This is under this, this is machine learning, right? And you can say that's ML. You see that in the literature a lot. ML, machine learning. I'm not gonna write a bunch of sentences. It'll take forever. I can just tell you what machine learning is. Basically, algorithms and statistical models in general to learn and make predictions without human intervention. It sounds just like what I said AI was. But remember, I said AI could be done with hard-coded decision trees. It would appear to perform the human task with, but without that much learning. Machine learning is specifically a type of algorithm that attempts to learn and improve upon itself over time based on some outcome. So some outcome happens and it tries to learn from that data. Or maybe you give it a bunch of training data and uh, the model that is running, the machine learning model, tries to improve itself over many, many training cycles. So it's the general class of computer algorithms that learn based on input data or based on a feedback loop from, from the output of whatever it is you're doing to try to get better over time, right? Uh, to learn, to train on data, to do decisions and actions. 
All right, there are many, many, many techniques for machine learning over the years. And many were tried and kind of hit kind of a maximum performance. And a different technique and different uh, performance level could be reached. You know, when they did the early days of chess and, uh, and other games, trying to get games to, uh, to be uh, played automatically with a computer. Different techniques were tried, right? And so all of that's machine learning when it tries to learn and get better. Ultimately, we have sort of nowadays settled on the concept of a neural network as sort of like the modern implementation of machine learning. One of the techniques that has taken us very far, there could be other techniques uh, down the road, there will be other techniques down the road that supersede probably neural networks, but neural networks is, is what we have landed on now. Neural networks are a set, a subset of machine learning. So underneath machine learning lives neural networks. Right? And, and typically you'll see that as NN, neural networks. All right, neural networks. The word neural brings to mind neuron. So neural networks are inspired by the brain. This does not mean they act like the brain. So just erase that from your mind. Our brains are more complicated than any of our neural net models that we know of. But we try to take the big, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of the big ideas from how we know the brain operates and put it into an architecture in a computer. And that's why they're called neural networks. The little computational bits in the neural network, they're called neurons. I'm gonna get into that a lot here in just a few minutes, so just be patient with me. But they're called neurons and they're interconnected. So when you see the image that everyone sees of a neural network with all the lines connecting everything, you can think of those little balls as neurons and those neurons are connected to other neurons, which are connected to other neurons, which are connected to other neurons as we know our brain operates. The human brain has something on the order of 80 to 85 billion, with a B, billion neurons. Now that's a lot of neurons, but when you, if you remember back to math, when you count the number of interconnections between objects, it's a much bigger number than 85 billion because every neuron in theory could connect to every other neuron. So if you're counting connections, it's many, many orders of magnitude larger than 80 billion there. So the power of a neural network is in the interconnections. The more interconnections you can have, the more patterns that can fire, and the more patterns that can fire, the more complex your system, and we know we need a complex system to, for instance, detect all classes of vehicles driving, or all classes of trees growing, or to understand that this is a pen, and then this other thing also is a pen, right? So we know we have to have a complex system. We know we have to have a mechanism for it to learn. And the way the human brain works is between the different neurons, there are connections, and the connection can be a strong or a weak connection. If it's a strong connection between neurons, then as one neuron fires, the likelihood is high that the neuron connecting to it will also fire. But if the connection, we call it the connection weight in neural networks, is weak, then if this neuron fires, then there's not a very a high likelihood that the neighboring neuron will fire. And over time, these connection weights can be adjusted in our brain. They are adjusted from birth. And so as you learn things and you get better, what's happening is the interconnection between the neurons, the physically the neurons grow together, but also even after they're grown together, the strength of the connection can be altered to adjust how likely it is for that neuron to fire based on a previous neuron to fire. So if we could see a picture inside our brain of the neurons going on, it would be a vortex of neurons firing and interacting and causing other adjacent neurons to fire and so on. So of course, artificial neural networks in computers are not as complicated as that, but the inspiration is taken from the brain. All right, and over time you want that neural network to improve and change the model. Now what do I mean by the model, right? Now I'm gonna transition from talking about the human brain to artificial neural networks. You have a computer program, right? Do not forget that no matter how complicated uh, the neural network is, it's just a computer program, right? So what we have running inside of there is some kind of model. It's a computational model. Inputs come into the model, I guess from your point of view, inputs come into the model. Lots of calculations are done in parallel. I'll show you that in just a minute. Outputs are then calculated that come out. And based on the outputs, oftentimes there's a feedback mechanism to change how the network behaves, to make it better over time. We call it training the neural network. If you're doing image recognition, if I give you 10,000 images to feed into your network, then you want the network to adjust itself so that it gets very good at recognizing those types of images. Or if I write a neural network, 
to do speech recognition or natural language processing, then I'll feed it the bit stream that comes out of my mouth. Uh, you know, when you have a waveform, you know, from sound waves, then a computer will turn that waveform into a stream of bits. The bits represent the the amplitude of that wave, and then that bitstream can go into a neural network. And it can operate on the bitstream like any other bit of data and begin to recognize different patterns of bits. And obviously you want it to recognize words and maybe even larger structures like sentences and paragraphs downstream in the network. But just as our visual cortex has specific, uh, a specific uh, neurons looking for movement, motion, edge detection, for instance, in a complicated neural network, we might have in an artificial neural net network, some neurons looking for edge detection, some neurons looking for movement. If it's speech recognition, some, uh, some neurons looking for low frequencies or mid frequencies or high frequencies. There can be infinite variety of how the networks are put together, right? But I just want to remind you of what's happening. There is a box called a model. And that model is trained and changed over time based on data, right? So let's draw a picture of what that might look like because I want you to have this mental image uh, in here. So I'll draw a little rectangle here and in here I'm gonna write the word model. When I write the word model, what I want you to think of is gigantic calculation happening, right? So there can be an input to this model. I'll put input here. And then inside here, some calculation takes place. And when I mean calculation, I literally mean multiplication, addition. Neural networks are full of multiplication and addition, right? It's literally a calculation that's happening inside, right? Computers just add. They just basically add, right? And multiplication is also adding. So when we multiply and add, we're just adding. So that's basically all computers can actually do at the chip level. So inside of here is a bunch of addition uh, and higher level multiplication. It uh, produces then an output. Whoops, if I can spell output. All right. Now, <clears throat> the model might operate on the input. The input can be whatever. It can be an image, a set of bits from an image. It can be uh, 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 the, the bits coming from the voice, my voice for speech recognition or whatever. And it's going to crunch on that and it's going to put an output. I think you said the word uh, cat. Uh, could be the output, for instance. Well, we want the model to get better. So what we really want to do is we want to take from the end and we want to go back in here and we want to make it better and better over time. So either you take your output and you tell it, yes or no, you did bad or not. Or maybe what you do is you just give it more data to train the model on. So what I will do here is I will say train. Now, the model is not always improved by a feedback loop like this. A lot of times it's just by feeding the model and training the model with more and more images or audio clips or whatever to try to make it better. But in any case, there's got to be some mechanism to make it better. Once the model is trained, it just performs the way it performs. And if it performs well, then awesome. You have a self-driving car. If it doesn't perform well, then not so great. You got to make it better, either by more training data, more training runs or whatever it is. Okay. Now I've drawn it with a single input and a single output, but actually the picture I want you to have in your mind is, mo is more complicated than that. The picture I want you to have in your mind, model, uh, is with many, many inputs and many, many outputs. So for instance, there's not like one or two or three, there's a bunch of inputs here. I'm gonna call this inputs. I've only drawn four, but there could be thousands of inputs here. You know, when you think about an image, uh, when you actually look at an image, it's a rectangular patch of pixels. Every pixel has a value. If it's a grayscale, then the value of every pixel will go from zero up to some maximum value. And if it's got color, there's even more data for every pixel. If it's a, uh, and every pixel will be its own value. So the uh, inputs here might be all of the pixels in an image. It might be thousands of inputs coming in here. If, it's, if the input is a, a waveform converted to binary, from with a computer, then the input might be a large amount of binary ones and zeros that represent whatever I've said, okay? So not just four or five inputs, could be thousands, could be millions of inputs coming into the model every second, right? And the output is not just one output, it's many, many, many outputs. So output, right? And then as I mentioned, uh, is architecturally you could do it many ways. You can either have a, a loop here to try to train in real time, 
if, did, did you do good, yes or no, and just continue feeding through and making the model better. Or maybe there's not an active loop here. Maybe it's just that the, uh, the, uh, 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 the, the model is trained over time with better and better input data to try to improve what's going on under the hood. The rest of the lesson we're going to spend going in here and understanding what's inside that box that we call a model. But before we get there, I want to talk about the different ways to uh, teach a super, uh, to teach a neural network. I mean, it's just a program, but it has to improve. If it doesn't learn, then we'll never be able to do anything useful with it. Now, I talked about all the applications of neural networks. I talked about all, all the applications that I wrote down. There are many others. But really, the holy grail of artificial intelligence is to develop artificial general intelligence, right? Whereas you could build some robot or computer that could converse with you and have what seems to approximate a personality and actually maybe where you couldn't determine if it was a robot or not. I know there's a lot of people that feel different ways about this, but your brain is a bunch of interconnected neurons. That is how you function. There is absolutely no reason why another machine that we could build could be trained in such a way to behave similarly. Absolutely no physical reason from the laws of physics that we couldn't do that. So that's the holy grail, right? Um, and so there are many ways to train neural networks. And I'm going to go over those really quickly before we get into the rest here. The first one is called supervised learning. This is the most common. Supervised learning. Supervised learning is basically when I train the model by giving it a bunch of labeled data. And what I mean by labeled data is I've already pre-classified a bunch of data. You know, for instance, <clears throat> for instance, I say, I say, okay, here is an image, if I can get it here, here's an image, and there's a bunch of pixels here, right? This is a rectangular grid of pixels, and I label it and say, this image is a vehicle, right? And then I, I do the same thing here, I say, okay, this one's a vehicle, and then I give it this picture. I'm not giving it paper, I'm giving it rectangular patches of pixels with different values, and I say, that's a vehicle, and I say, that one's a vehicle. You get the idea. That one's a vehicle, and so on. And I go do, and I do that not for 20 or 30 times. I do it for maybe 50,000 times or something like this, right? And I train that model to be able to pick up on whatever characteristics are in those images that allow us to recognize it as a car. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and pretend I'm a neuroscientist, right? But you know this is a car because you can see the wheels. You can infer the wheels on the other side. You, you can see seats. You can see doors. You can see the general shape of it. All of these things have general shapes. Now you come across weird ones like this. This one's a lot fatter and stubbier, but it still has a lot of the characteristics of the car, right? Uh, somewhere in here is a truck. Here's a truck. This one's different as well. This one has a big weird cutout in the back, but it has the general characteristics. All of them have these general characteristics, right? What if I feed a bunch of images of these things here? So this is a tree, right? I say, well, this is a tree. I give it this rectangular patch of pixels and I say, here's a tree. All right, this one's a tree. That looks different though. This is a tree, right? I can keep going. This is a tree, that one's upside down. You get the idea, right? What are the general uh, similarities between all those trees? Well, they all had you know, uh, they all had a, a, a brown trunk. They had a green top, right? They, these were all cartoony trees. What about real pictures of trees? You get the idea. We know that they're the same classification, but we know that because we have been trained on tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of images that we have taken through our eyes and learned about. And we have batches of neurons in our brain that fire when we see certain things that we recognize. And that is done through a training regimen. So supervised learning means that I give it labeled data. It's the most common. And we do it with labeled data. In other words, I give you 10,000 pictures of trees and then I tell the computer that's a tree. And I know that it's correct because a human has come up with this list of labeled data, right? This is used in image recognition, speech recognition, language processing. You know, I can, I can have a bunch of different speakers of languages say the word fox, trunk, television, you know, and I take 10,000 samples of the word television and feed it as a labeled data packet into the, into the neural network and it's pre-labeled. So I'm trying to teach a network based on data ahead of time that's pre-labeled, right? The next, um, the next way to train a neural network is called unsupervised learning. 
So uh, this is training on unlabeled data. You might say, how do you train on unlabeled data? Well, what you do is, for the, one example of why you would want to do this, is for fraud detection. If I run a bank that has credit cards and I have a million customers with credit cards, I may not know ahead of time what a fraudulent transaction looks like. It's not like tree or, or car. Uh, it's, it's, it, but I know there has to be some pattern to it. If I purchase um, a golden ring um, you know, in two cities over from where I live, that is very out of character from what I usually purchase. So a neural network for that is looking for patterns in data that's already unlabeled. That it doesn't really know what to look for, but it's just looking for, for unusual things in the data, essentially. That's what we call unsupervised learning. Right? And the last one we're gonna talk about briefly here is called reinforcement learning. This one's actually really cool. Reinforcement learning is based on rewards. And a minute ago when I drew the picture with the arrow that comes back, that can sort of be thought of as reinforcement learning also. Well, I'll get into the details in a second. Um, this is often used in robotics. When a robot learns to walk, I mean, we have robots that have not been told how to walk, how to move their motors to walk. But they've been, uh, basically, when they fall over, they, they mark that as a failure and try to do different things. We can even simulate this in computers to try to simulate how things learn how to walk. And it turns out things can learn to walk and run really, really well if you let them try 100 million times, but mark all the failures as bad. And failure is defined as whenever it hits the ground, okay? So we build robots, and through environmental feedback, we can get a yes or no training thing going on. Also, video games. We have lots of video games that have been trained to play with artificial intelligence and basically they just play a hundred million games against uh, against itself or against another human when it loses a game then it learns from that by adjusting the neural network all right so we've talked about unsupervised learning we've talked about supervised learning we've talked about reinforcement learning so now what we need to do is sort of go into part two of this discussion i want to start to move into how it's done Right, that big picture you always see with interconnections and neurons, I want to break it down for you. But before we get into it, I want you to take a deep breath. Because when I first started learning this stuff, it's like, whoa, that looks complicated. I promise you, it's not complicated. Now, in practice, it's complicated because the, there could be lots of connections. But the idea behind it is actually not complicated. So let me take some of this down, reset, and we're going to jump into how these things are done in the most basic way. And by the end of it, you will understand how neural networks are put together and in general, how they learn. All right, now let's proceed. What we want to do is understand this image. This is the image you see of all neural networks. It looks like spaghetti. It looks crazy and complicated. And when you look at this image, if you're like me, you think, I'm never going to understand this. This just looks so complicated. So what I'm going to do is start here, explain how the process of training a network and sort of like its decision making happens. But then I'm going to make a simpler and simpler and simpler network to make it easy to understand the basic building blocks so that when you come back and look at this one, you will understand exactly what's going on and how it works. All right, this is a uh, neural network. We have inputs. These inputs are listed by these little circles here. I'll talk about the circles in a second. And then we have the outputs. In this case, there's only three outputs. Now, the inputs and the outputs are basically what we see, uh, meaning that it's kind of like our brain. We have inputs, meaning vision and sound, and we have outputs, meaning speech. We don't really know what's happening inside our brain. We have instruments that can measure neural activity and things now, but our brain is basically a black box just like this neural network is basically a black box. There are what we call hidden layers in between the input and the output. Now here, this is just for illustration purposes where I only have this many inputs and this many hidden layers. Here's a layer and here's another layer. And then here's a, an output layer. But mostly what I want you to understand is that these hidden layers are basically obscured from view if all you look at is what you send into the neural network and what you get out from the neural network, then all you really care about is that the input and the output are doing things you want. The input to the self-driving car is everything it sees, everything it perceives, and the output is maybe the driving action. As long as all that stuff uh, in the perception uh, accuracy, as long as all that stuff is happening and doing great, then I guess you don't really care about what's happening on the inside because they're all hidden. In other words, humans are not explicitly programming what's going on in the interior of the neural network. That's the whole point. The algorithm programs itself, and I'm gonna to talk to you how that happens in, in a second. 
But these, that's why these are called hidden layers. The other thing I want to tell you is that just for illustration purposes, I put only two hidden layers, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven neurons. Every one of these circles is what we call a neuron. I'm talking about that in a second. These are also neurons, and these are neurons. But I only have two interior layers, and they only have seven neurons. Now, in a real neural network, um, there could be hundreds or thousands of neurons just in the interior hidden layers. Right? Also, they don't, there doesn't have to be two hidden layers. A real neural network for something complex might have five neural uh, interior layers with varying number of neurons and a, a varying number of inputs and a varying number of outputs than what I've drawn here. Right? Now you might say, well, why don't we just make a neural network with like a trillion uh, hidden layers and make it super complex, then it can do anything, right? Well, you see, evolutionarily, our brain is only so big, right? It could be bigger, but it's not. And there has to be a reason for that. And my guess, it's just a guess, is that as you increase the complexity of things, you also make it harder to train. In other words, if our brain were as big as the Earth, it would probably be very hard to train because it would be so physically large. The growth of cells takes time, you know. In, in a computer, the propagation of, 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 of transistors and things like this, they have fixed switching times and things. So you can't just build something infinitely big. So when you architect a neural network as the designer, you're in charge of saying, okay, I want three interior uh, hidden layers uh, and one input and output uh, set of neurons of this many. Now how they connect themselves is up to the training process, but you're in charge of how and how many layers there are. Now you wanna have enough layers for good amount of complexity to get a number of uh, uh, enough knobs to turn, so to speak, to make the network perform well, but you also don't wanna have so many that it's never gonna train or it never converge on a solution. It might keep training forever and ever and ever and never be able to find a set of connection strengths between neurons to do what you're trying to do. So uh, you can't make it infinitely big is all I'm trying to say. And that's sort of the skill of the true experts in this field to figure out how, to, uh, how complex a network should be. One more thing I'm gonna say before I forget because I, I might forget and I, I don't wanna forget. I'm drawing this as an example, but I want you to think about this. This could be, you need to think about a real system might be comprised of many different neural networks that are also interconnected. You see, th these inputs are connected to this layer, and then this layer is connected to this layer, and then this layer is connected to this layer. And every little circle that you see, every one of these circles is a calculation. It's like a function from math. We're gonna get into it in just a second. It's a calculation. like. This one's connected to all of these with the red lines. There's a calculation happening here and a value being stored. This value, along with values of all these other neurons, are fed into this neuron and a calculation happens. And then this neuron receives as its input the, this, the signals from here. Again, a calculation happens. So it's sort of a cascading set of calculations kind of going downstream there. But you might think of a very complicated system. Let's think about the concept of a stop sign. A stop sign is octagon shaped, right? But it's red, and it also has the word stop inside in a certain font. So you might think a very complicated neural network might have edge detection. Maybe just a set of neurons that are just trained on detecting straight edges in an image and where they are, right? Then you may have a totally separate neural network which looks at uh, colors and determining the colors, red, green, blue, whatever. And then you might have another separate neural network that looks and it is trained on recognizing letters. The, what does the S look like? What does the T look like? What does the O look like? And so on. And then you may have other neural networks as well that deal with motion and other things, okay? And to recognize a stop sign or to recognize the word stop, it might be the combination of the output of a bunch of different neural networks. The neural network that focuses on edges and shapes might look for octagon shapes. The neural network that looks for letters to put them into words might know that it says stop. The neural network that looks at colors might notice it's red. And the neural network that, I don't know, looks at poles or whatever might recognize that that object's on a pole. And all of those things together feeding into a granddaddy neural network at the end might recognize it as a stop sign. We do know that that's how our brain works. When we recognize objects, we're looking at different characteristics of the object and they're built up when enough characteristics are triggered, we recognize it as the object. There have been many, many experiments in, in uh, neurobiology on 
image recognition. And so we know that our recognition of images is built up of smaller pieces. And so when you look at this, even though it looks simple, think of it as once you learn this, then you can apply it to totally different neural networks, which might feed into a final neural network for whatever the, the process is you're, you're doing. In the case of image recognition, for a stop sign, it would be that. For speech recognition, it would be looking, you might have one neural network looking for consonant sounds, another neural network looking for vowel sounds, another one looking for intonation, another one looking for frequency, and so on. And built up, they can detect in the presence of words with different dialects, okay? Now, what I want to do is talk about in general how this thing works. Forget about the math for a second. What I want to do is say, here are the inputs, right? And here are the outputs. The outputs, in this case, can be one of three things. All right, this one right here is going to be uh, a car. And when I say car, I mean uh, any automobile, truck or car, bus, whatever. This neuron right here is uh, related to any trees that it detects. And then this one is any cats that it detects. So there's three outputs for three different objects classifications that this neural network has been trained on. In the real world, it might be trained on millions of objects, okay? But this one's only trained on three. Now forget about the input layers, the, uh, the hidden layers, sorry. The input layer, what is the input layer? Well, here is an image. Let me grab a, let me grab a good one here. Here is an image right here. And so right here is a car. So when I say input, la input layer, what are these input values? When you look at what an image is, it is a rectangular grid of pixels. Every little pixel in here, this is white, 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 orange, 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 white, 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 orange, gray, 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 black, gray, 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 black. You see what I mean? You can take any image that you have, which is a rectangular grid, you can stretch it out just like a kind of like wrapping around to the next line. You can stretch it out into a linear list of pixels. Each pixel has a value. And these, think of these as pixels. So this is the first pixel, this is the second pixel, third pixel, fourth pixel. So if you turn this thing sideways, then it's like white, 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 and you get to here, and then it's like orange, 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 orange. Now these pixels are, these, these neurons are just numbers though. So when I say white and orange, I just mean there's a numeric value for each color, right? And the different uh, value of the color is represented inside of each of these neurons here, which are basically pixels. So in this case, I only have, I think, 11. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. But in a real image, there's like thousands of pixels, maybe millions of pixels. So the input layer can have lots of inputs. I just can't draw that many. And then the interior hidden layers could have thousands of, of, connect, of, of neurons as well. And then the output layer, uh, you, generally they get smaller because the output is trying to classify a smaller number of objects. Now, let's do a thought experiment. I've already done that, that one, so let me go ahead and we'll do, yeah, let's do this one. Let's say I put this one as the input to the neural network. Let me go grab another, let me go grab another magnet over here. Let's say I, I put this, I'm gonna put it sideways here. Um, and I'm feeding this image in. That means all the pixels here are going into the neural network. Some calculations happen, and then all of these neurons are filled with numbers now based on a calculation I'm gonna show you in a second, based on the pixels. But then all of these values are then, again, operated and calculated on to propagate to all of these neurons, which are hidden, again, from my direct view. But these are full of different numbers. And then once I have numbers here, then the final three, again, get filled with numbers. And what you want your neural network to say, for instance, is that if a car gets fed into the input, then what you really want is this neuron to contain the value 0 0.95, let's say, and meaning one, one would be, let's say, the highest value this neural network could, could output. Then you would want something like 0 0.95 for this uh, neuron here. And then the tree neuron, you want it to say something like 0 0.12, and the cat neuron, maybe 0 0.04 or something. Then when you look at the output, you would say, well, this is very close to one. This, these two are very low. And then all you would have to do is look and say, I'm just gonna take the highest value that comes out of the output of the network. And I'm gonna say, that is what the network has decided this image is. So when you read about neural networks, they say, oh, the neural network's making decisions. And the decision is that this is a stop sign. This is a cat. This is a car. This is a truck. And you start thinking, well, how is it talking? How does it tell you this? Well, there's outputs of the neural networks and the values that come out dictate what the neural network has sort of detected as the input, okay? So then let's change this around. 
right? Let's say that, let me find a better one here. Let's put this one in. Instead of this one, I'm gonna put this one as the input. You can still see it's a vehicle. I mean, all of us would agree that's a vehicle, but it looks quite different than the other one. It's uh, physically shorter, but it has a similar characteristics, right? Now I've already written my numbers down, so I can't do, I, I'm not gonna write over them. But if you put this image in, then the network, once it does the calculation, maybe it gets something a little lower, 0 0.92, maybe the tree 0 0.11, the cat 0 0.09 or something. Still the highest value is the car with a pretty high percent certainty. So you would conclude the network has determined that that is a car with a certain percentage success. And I could go through here and say, well, that's that's a car. Now this one looks different than a car, but it, because the bed of it looks a little different, right? Because that's a truck. But still, you would expect that the highest number would be here, maybe 0 0.82 and some other numbers down here where it'd be clear that it had determined it was an automobile, right? Then you get something like this. Again, this looks very different, and, but you still would expect this to be the highest value. It would detect essentially automobiles. Now, how do you get it to return the correct answer. You do that by feeding it maybe 50,000 images of all different kinds of vehicles. Short, big, small, fat, skinny, long, thin, from different angles, right? And through the process of training, I'll talk about in a second, this interior network gets trained with the correct values that exist between here. I'm going to show you what they are in a second. So that when I feed images in, it reliably gives me the correct classification on this side. To the point where even if you put an image in that it was not trained on, let's say this car was not even in the training set, ideally you want the network to still, with a high percent accuracy, give you the correct output, even when it was not, when it's, even when it's operating on an image it wasn't trained with. That's, that's what you want, right? And that's the goal of a neural network, all right? We can do the same exercise. We can do the exact same exercise when it's not cars. Let's do the exact same exercise with trees, right? So here is a tree. I can feed this pixel image in here, right? Lots of pixels all the way across. Some are white, some are green, some are brown, and they're all values. And so I can put these pixels into the input layer that can be operated on to get values here. Then these values can be operated on to get the values here. Then these values can be operated on to get the final three values. Ideally, whenever I pass this image in, I want the car number to be like 0.01, I want the tree to be like 0.99, and I want the cat to be 0.02 or something. I want very low values and high values. Now what if I feed it this one? Maybe I didn't train it on any trees that looked at all like this one. You know, maybe I just use different kinds of trees. Who knows? There's lots of different kinds of trees. If the network is unsure what this thing is, then what you might get is something like 0.55 for the car, 0.63 for the tree, 0.84 for the cat, or very similar numbers within a few points of each other. If you ever get numbers that are similar on the output there, then it just means that the network was, was not sure of that, of that image. Or if the network was only trained on cars and trees and cats, what if I give it a picture of a camel? It's not going to know what a camel looks like. Hopefully it'll return cat because it's a little closer than, than the other ones. But the, the idea is the network is trained on data. And uh, the only way that you can rely on it to classify images it hasn't seen before is if you give it a lot of data. So neural networks are hungry for data. And they do perform well if you feed them enough data. If you don't feed them enough data and you, it doesn't have enough generalities in the data, then of course it's not gonna perform well at all. So over time, you wanna make the network better by feeding it better and better data. All right, now I wanna give you another example over here. Um, this example that I gave you right here was I think a good one, but it has a lot of input layers uh, and a lot of output layers. I think what I wanna do, actually before I go on to the next one, is I wanna redraw the same network down here. That's what I did here. Because this is very, very hard to look at. Now what I've done here is I've stripped away all of the gray uh, interconnections. I want you <clears throat> to fully internalize that every one of these circles is a calculation. In math, we call it a function. Or in programming, we call it a function. In neural networks, we call it a neuron. A neuron is either going to be an input value in which it's not calculated on, it's just the input value, but every one of these other neurons are calculated on. This neuron depends on all of the input data, plus I'm gonna show in a minute here, 
there's a weight associated with each of these red lines, just like in biological neurons, there is a connection strength between neurons. It sort of determines how likely it is for the next neuron to fire. Each of these red lines has sort of a connection strength. And when I calculate the value at this point, it depends on all of the pixels in the image, for instance, if it's an image, and the relative weights. And the weights that are, exist between here and here, those are the knobs. When we train the neural network, when we say it's training, what we're doing is it's adjusting the weights and also something called the biases I'll talk about in a second. But it's basically adjusting the connection weights between the neurons. That's how the calculation for the value of this neuron happens. If we change the weights, we change how the network behaves. This neuron depends on all the previous layers neurons. This neuron depends on all the previous layers neurons. So when you look at a complicated drawing like this, what you need to do is you need to put your finger on a neuron and say this depends on all the previous layers neurons and on the connections between them. This one here depends on all the other neurons as well. This one here depends on all the input neurons. This one, all the other neurons. So every neuron in this layer depends on every pixel in the input image, if you're talking about an image, or every bit value of the voice stream that you're using or whatever. Every pixel here depends on a calculation that, that takes into account the entire image. However, with different weights. These red weights are going to be some numbers, but these weights here in gray that I haven't drawn will be different weights, different numbers. And then these will be different numbers, and then these weights will be different numbers. So every neuron, when you put your finger on a neuron, you should be able to trace it to the previous level, and they all have unique weights associated with it. Every weight in the image is a knob that can be turned to tweak how this network will perform, how it will calculate. I told you it's a calculation, okay? And the same thing here. This one's depending on the previous layer. This one's depending on the previous layer with different weights. This one's depending on the previous layer. Same neurons, but different weights. This one is operating on the same previous level neurons, but with different weights, different weights, different weights, different weights. I keep emphasizing it because this one's depending only on the previous level with these weights in yellow. But this one, different weights. This one, different weights, same neurons. So when you strip away all the other connections, you can see that this depends on the previous neuron, that this one depends on the previous neurons, and this one depends on the previous neurons. Input data, hidden layers, output layer. That's the main paradigm of how it works. Now I want you to keep this mental image of input layers, hidden layers, and output layers. It looks very complicated. What I want to do now is simplify this network to make it easier for us to talk about. Here is another neural network. It has only one, two, three, four, five input values. These are neurons, values, numbers. In other words, five pixels coming in, let's say. Two hidden layers with three neurons each, and then only two output layers. This is obviously uh, not going to be a good neural network. There's not enough connections, okay? But it's good for us to talk about. So what could be the output of this neural network, right? One neuron is going to fire when the network thinks it's a stop sign, and the other neuron is going to fire or have a high value when it thinks it's a yield sign. So what you're going to put, put into the left-hand side of this network over here is going to be the pixels for an image of some street sign. Now, I've only got five pixels. There's probably like a million pixels in a real image, right? But I'm only going to give you five so we can talk about it. It's going to be calculated to get uh, this neuron is depending on all five pixels with these weights in red. This neuron is depending on the same five pixels with different weights. This neuron is depending on the same input pixels with yet different weights. These will then be calculated. Then these will be calculated in the same way. Then these will be calculated based on the previous layer with different weights. Different weights, different weights, different weights. These are the knobs that can be turned. So you say stop signs are easy. Let's take a look at some stop signs. Okay. Here, it's a tr like a typical stop sign, but you notice it's not perfect. It's got these marks all over it. It's not like a, a solid color. The word STOP has like divots and bumps in it. It's not a perfect stop sign. The lettering looks better here, right? Um, the color of the border is not pure white. It's kind of yellowed. This is much more yellow. This one has a little sign under it that isn't even present here. Now, we know these are both stop signs, and you know what this means, but a computer doesn't know that. And then you have this. We know this is a stop sign, but it's clearly not an octagon shape anymore. How do you know it's a stop sign? Well, because you can read most of the letters, and you know that this would have been an octagon if it was bent, because you know how the world works, and you also know that this is a stop sign. Even for signs, there is tremendous variation in 
what it can look like to a computer. So we all know these are stop signs. We want to have this kind of thing operate in a neural network. I want to feed it pixels of images of a stop sign. And if it is a stop sign, I want this to be a very high value. And if it's a yield sign, uh, the triangle sign, I want this to have a high value and this a low value. So let's say I put an actual stop sign here. Then I want this value to be something like 0 0.99, and the yield sign is like something like 0 0.03. Notice that the computer is never 100% sure of what it's doing. It's never going to say 100%. It's just going to be out of 1, 0.99 is very, very close. And the yield sign, the numeric value, very, very low, close to 0. And then you're going to look and say, which one has the higher value? I'm going to say that's what the network says. If the network ever gives you something like 0.44 and 0.53, where they're very, very close, then the network's not sure. Either it wasn't trained well, or the input data is so far different than what it was trained on, then it just doesn't perform well at all. And sometimes neural networks can do that. They can give you confident answers for garbage input if it wasn't trained well. So you have to have gargantuan sets of data to train under different circumstances. When you do that, then the outputs behave, in, in general, better and better with the more training data that you have. All right, so we're gonna do the same little exercise here, just to um, reinforce it, that I stripped away all the other interconnections. This second layer neuron is dependent on all of the input, in, case, in, this, in the case of a picture, these five pixels. Now there's really millions of pixels, but in this case it's dependent on these five with weights that I haven't written down yet, but they're here, I'm, I'm gonna talk about. They're all different weights. And then this neuron is dependent on only the previous layer with these weights in green. And this output neuron is dependent on its previous layer with these outputs in yellow. And as you put your finger on a neuron, you could put your finger here and you could say, okay, well this one is dependent on all of the previous layers. You could just draw them in here. And each little line I'm drawing is a weight. It's a number here. And this neuron, I could draw them here, and this one I can draw them here. So it's better than just looking at a giant spaghetti mess. Just put your finger on a neuron and say, it depends on some calculation from the previous layer with independent weights. And we're going to talk about biases in a second as well, okay? Now, before I go on to the math behind it, uh, I want to just say again one more time that in real systems that are complex, you may have multiple neural networks working together. You might have an edge detection neural network. You might have a movement neural network that fires when things are moving, right? You might have uh, some kind of identification neural network for letters and signs in, in, in you know, the English language, or if it's a different uh, country, a different characters for, for the language. Uh, alphabet words, things like this, and they may all feed into another neural network which takes as inputs all of those things and produces outputs and directions for whatever it is we're trying to do. So at this point we have described the neural network takes values on the, on the left side, does a big calculation, and, does, and outputs values on the right hand side. If you remember back to algebra, that should remind you of something you learned called a function. A function is a mathematical object that takes an input value, calculates it on, on it, and it produces an output value. So I want to take some of these off the board and I need to review a little bit about functions so that I can write down the mathematical statement that this neural network is, is uh, generating so that you can understand mathematically more than what I've talked about so far how it behaves. So now we need to go down memory lane and talk about functions. All right. Now, in neural networks, we call them neurons. I'm going to call it from now on a function. Uh, but just in your mind, know that the word function, you can sort of replace it with the, the, the idea of a neuron. Okay, That's what, we, what, it, what it really is. Now, because I use circles here in the neural network, I'm going to use a circle to represent the function. So here is a circle, one of these neurons, right? And it takes some input value. I'm going to put input here. And it generates or calculates some output value right? In and out. Now what is inside of here is some sort of calculation. This is any mathematical function. Now in math class you learn about quadratic functions. You learn about cubic functions. You learn about all kinds of functions. We only care about lines because in this example I'm giving you it's going to be based upon a line. Now you could in theory make a neural network that doesn't really work with lines. It works with other, other polynomials, other higher curves, but the vast majority deal with lines. So we're only going to talk about lines here. Now the equation of a line, you might remember, is mx plus b. So here I'm going to put f of x, that's a function notation, function of x. Uh, let's call it 2x plus the number 1. This is the calculation happening inside of this thing, right? 
And what it means is if I take a value of x is equal to zero and I put it in here, then two times zero is zero, and then I add one, and the output, f of x, is just one. That's what I get for the output. And if I put a value of two in here, two times two is four, plus one is five. So f of x is equal to five. These are the output values. And if I put a negative value in here, negative uh, three here, two times negative three is negative six, plus one, means it's negative five on the output here, all right? So what I have is inputs and outputs. These inputs you can think of pixel values, sort of, and uh, for that first neuron, uh, anyway. And uh, it's doing some calculation and it's putting uh, a different output. This, uh, inside of this neuron, is the calculational engine that is happening. Now, I've written that function as 2x plus 1, but the whole idea of training a neural network is tweaking and slowly changing what these little bitty functions do, because don't forget, this is a function, this is a function, this is a function, this is a function. They're just, it depends on many, many additional input variables than just the one x, right? Because in this case, the neuron only depended on one different input line. This neuron depends on a bunch of different input lines. But we gotta keep it simple in the beginning, okay? What I can say is that <clears throat> this two here in front of the x is a knob. And this one here is a knob, right? We call this knob the slope of the line, and we call this line the y-intercept. In the literature for neural networks, we call it the bias. All right, so let's go over here, go back to you know high school math here. Here's x, here's f of x. When you graph the line with these points here, or you could just look at the equation, 2x plus 1, the y-intercept 1 means it crosses the y-axis there, or the f of x-axis there. The 2 is a slope of 2, which means rise 2 and run 1. Remember, the slope is rise over run. It goes up 2 over 1, which means it's something like this. And that means that this line, if I were to draw it, goes through these two points like this. And of course, I can't draw a straight line, but you get the idea. Okay? Now, let's create another function, just to have some variety. Here is a totally different neuron, totally different function, right? And this function, just like the previous one, had an input, a single input, and a single output, right? And what is this function? Let's change it a little bit. Let's say f of x, f of the input, is equal to 1x plus 0, because the, the y-intercept can be any number. It can be 0. Actually, they can be negative numbers, too. And I haven't gotten too much into negative numbers in neural networks. Just hang on. I'll talk a little bit about it in, in a few minutes. All right, the input values can be the same input values as before, or they can be different input values. If I turn these knobs and change the function into this, if I uh, uh, you know, put an input value of zero, I'm, still, I'm gonna get a different output value. So I can say x equals zero coming in, zero times one is zero, you add zero, you get an output of zero, right? If you put an x value of two, same input value, then two times one is two, and then you add the zero, you get an output of two. If you put x, again, equals negative three, then you have negative three times uh, one is negative three, you add zero, you get negative three. So you see what happened. The concept of a function is a mathematical calculational object with knobs. One of the knobs is called the slope, and you can change it. We change it to a one here. One of them is called the y-intercept, which we also call a bias in neural networks, and we can change it. In this case, we change it to a zero. With the original function, we operated on the exact same input values, and we got these output values. But once we turned the knobs a little bit, the model, or the, the neuron, changed functions. And so the same exact input values gave totally different output values. This means that as you change the knobs on the neural network, whereas the real neural network has lots of weights you can change everywhere, okay? As you change them, then the output values can change. That's why after it gets trained better and better, then it'll start telling you that a car is a car and a tree is a tree. But initially, when you first uh, uh, let a neural network run, you initialize all of the weights, the slopes, and the biases, the y-intercepts, you initialize them to random numbers. Then you calculate an output, and you see, is it good or bad? And then there's a mechanism to change the weights, change the knobs, to make it better and better and better over time. That we have to talk about a little bit later. For now, just know that this is a different function. Just for giggles, what does this function look like over here if we were to graph it? We have x, we have f of x. The y-intercept is zero in this case, so that means it crosses right here. The slope is one, which means rise over run is one over one. And so this 
uh, slope, this line, would look like this. So it crosses the axis in a different place and the, the steepness of it is a little different than it was before. The point of this is just to remind you what a function is, to remind you that in math class you learn that a function takes a single input and produces a single output. Right? And as you turn the knobs, in this case the 2 is a knob called the slope, and the y-intercept is a knob that we call the bias, as you change the knobs you totally change what the function does. You change its behavior completely so that even with the same input values you get different output values. All right. So for instance, let's say we weren't doing image recognition, we weren't doing, doing uh, speech recognition, anything complicated like that. Let's say that we were just training this data and we just gave it, uh, we, or we're just training the network on the three sets of input data. And let's say that our input data for the training uh, was uh, the point 0, 0, the point 2, uh, 2, and the point negative 3, negative 3. In other words, instead of a picture or something, then I'm just telling it when x is 0, I want the output to be 0. When x is 2, I want the output to be 2. When x is negative 3, I want the output to be negative 3. This is, instead of an image, this is what I'm training it to do. If you started off with this function randomly, then the outputs would be wrong because 0 in and 1 out is wrong. 2 in and 5 out is not correct, and you would have to have some mechanism to turn these knobs. Eventually, after maybe 10 or 100 iterations, you got down to this function through a, a, an algorithm that changes these knobs. Now the input of 0 gives you an output of 0. The input of 2 gives you an output of 2, and so on. Then, if you trained it on this data and you want it to behave well against this data, this is a better function, a better model, a better neuron than this one. This tiny little example is the best, simplest example I can give of training a neural network. The only real difference is that in this case, I told you the training data was super simple, but in a real neural network, it's thousands of inputs, many, many individual uh, interior layer, hidden layers here, and then multiple outputs as well because you have this guy depending on the previous layer, this guy depending on the previous layer, and so on. So we've talked about functions with one input and one output. Now we have to finally go and put the rubber to the road or the pencil to the paper to talk about this neural network, which is already simplified. This neuron, put your finger on this neuron. It depends only on the input values of these neurons here which we can see from the original drawing. Uh, of course, the original drawing had more layers, okay, or more, more neurons. You see it's only dependent on the previous layer with these red lines which represent the weights. Here, I have fewer of them because I simplified the network, and I put the weights in red. What this means is that pixel number one has a relative weight of one in terms of its effect on this neuron. Pixel number two has a relative weight of three. Pixel number three has a relative weight of two, and so on. Now, how do, you might say, well, how do you determine these weights? Well, what you actually do is you initialize the network randomly. Random number generator. That's what I did. These are just random numbers. And then it calculates some output. It will be wrong. But then through the training mechanism, which I'll talk to you about in a second, we have a way of adjusting these weights to get it a little bit closer to better performance. And if you do this process a million times, then you can get the network to adjust all of the weights of all of the connections in such a way that the output behaves better and better and better, and then it begins to converge on you know, something that is useful. All right? But right now what I want you to know is that this neuron is dependent on uh, each of the input pixels with these weights. Now this second, this, this neuron in gray, I've now, if you go down here, made it active and showed you that this neuron is again dependent on all five inputs, but with different weights. Here, this pixel doesn't have as much, uh, has actually no impact here, a weight of zero, a weight of one, but this pixel seems to have a lot more of an impact in terms of how this thing is going to behave or how it's going to influence this neuron here. But again, it's uh, dependent on all of the previous pixels with totally different weights than were, uh, existed for the uh, 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 neuron up here. Now let's look at the third neuron. Okay, The uh, third neuron is down here. And it is dependent, again, on all of the 
uh, original pixels of the image or whatever with totally different weights. And you can see that pixel number three has no effect, but this one has a much higher weight and you have different weights. I want you to internalize in your mind that every neuron depends on the previous layer with an independent set of weights. If you put your finger on a different neuron, it depends on the previous layer with totally different weights. If you put your uh, finger on any neuron in this drawing, this one, it depends on the previous layer's neurons with totally independent weights and also biases, which is the y-intercept. I'm gonna to talk to you about that in just a second. Just like this neuron, which was a super simple neuron, had a knob that we called the slope, and then we had a knob called the y-intercept. Together, turning these knobs can change the slope of the curve and also shift it up and down. The y-intercept shifts it up and down. The slope changes the angle of it. Together, you can pretty much cover the whole xy plane in a very simple linear function like this. So now what I wanna do is I wanna write down what the value of this neuron actually is. All right, the value of this neuron. So what it, the way it works is, whatever the value of this pixel is, is multiplied by the weight. But then the value of this pixel is multiplied by its weight. And then the value of this pixel is multiplied by its weight. These are multiplied, these are multiplied. So it's the value of the pixel matters, but the weight of the connection also matters. And then after you get all these multiplications, you add them all together. That addition of all that stuff is what, uh, with one thing I'll tell you in a second, is what goes into here. So if we can remember in our mind these weights, one, three, two, five, two. Let's say it with me because I'm going to write them down in a minute. One, three, two, five, two. 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 Then if we label this neuron here, if we call it neuron one, just the, the first neuron in my little list here, just for demonstration purposes, then I could then say that neuron one has a value which is equal to, remember it was one, three, two, five, two. Uh, the coefficient of one times the first uh, input pixel, we called it x1, remember? And then uh, three times x2, and then two times x3, and then five times x4, and then uh, two times x5. One, three, two, five, two. Let's go back here. One, three, two, five, two. And I labeled them first uh, pixel coming in and then fifth pixel here, or first input value to the fifth input value. So I did exactly what I said I would do. I multiplied the value that's in this circle, whatever it is, the pixel value or the, the bit value, whatever's in there, times the weight, 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 and then we add them all together. This is a generalization of this. Notice that that's what this function did. It was something times a, a, an input value, but the there was only one input value. I mean, I've listed three different numbers here, but there's still only one particular uh, input coming into it. So it's mx, and then we had a, a, a y-intercept or a bias. So what we do to calculate the value of this uh, neuron is we sum up the multiplication of the value of the neuron previous times the weight, we add all of those together, but then we add a kind of a y-intercept term called a bias term. So what I'm gonna do over here is I'm gonna put it in red and I'm gonna say plus b1, all right? So this is like the y-intercept. This is sort of like the y-intercept for the function. Uh, these are the, the, x val the inputs to the neuron. Now these, these inputs to the neuron, x1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, don't forget, it's like a function. They can all take on different values. If I put a picture of an elephant uh, going into this neural network, then the value of the pixels, one, two, three, four, and five, they're gonna have different values. If I put a picture of a, of a, of a snake, then those pixel values will be different. But, so no matter what picture I put in, these input variables will have different values and it will calculate a value for that neuron based on that. The connection weights are given by the, by the neural network and the training process changes the weights and also, this I left as a variable because the bias, which is the y-intercept, is also changed during, during the training process. All right, let's, let's keep going and talk about um, the second neuron. We have the weights here, same inputs, but the weights 0, 1, 1, 2, 6, 0, 1, 1, 2, 6, 0, 1, 1, 2, 6, 0, 1, 1, 2, 6. So the second neuron, N2, which I can just call this thing N2 right here, 0, 1, 1, 2, 6. Help me remember. 0, 1, 1, 2, 6. We have 0, right? Uh, 1, 1, 2, 6. So 1, and then here we have x2, and then 1, and then we have x3, and then 2, and then we have x4, and then we have 6x5. 
And I'm gonna erase this because I've already said that the B term is sort of like the Y intercept. And so we've multiplied and added all the weights, but then we have another bias for that neuron. I'm gonna talk about bias in, in just a second, um, but I wanna get through writing down all the equations first. So that's, that's the value of the second neuron is gonna be governed by that equation. It's just a, a more complicated version of a line. Now, the third neuron is again, dependent upon all the previous inputs, but with different weights. 26011, 26011, 26011, 26011. I'm gonna call that neuron three, 26011. Two, uh, six, zero, one, one. Okay, two, six, zero, one, one. And then we have a bias, a third bias, a third y-intercept. Notice all I've done. All I've said is that each one of these neurons looks like an equation of a line. But instead of one input and one slope, they all have many inputs and many slopes. But still, it behaves like an equation of a line. You add all that stuff together, and then you add a y-intercept, which we call a bias. So that neuron is basically a bunch of things added and multiplied together from the different inputs, just like a line, but with more inputs, with a unique bias. The second neuron is the same linear combination as what we call it, of inputs and, uh, uh, and, and weights, and uh, with its own unique bias. And then the third neuron has the same exact input uh, you know, uh, neurons, but with different weights attached to it. Now, before I go any farther, how do I say this? The weights and the biases, they can be trained and tuned and changed. They are trained and tuned and changed during the training process, all right? The biases here that are over here are basically there because the value of the bias will greatly affect if the next neuron is really gonna be triggered or not, right? Because if this is, uh, no matter what this stuff is over here, if the bias uh, is maybe 100, let's say, then the value of this neuron is gonna be very, very high. And don't forget, this neuron feeds into the next neuron. So if this neuron has a very high bias, then no matter what the input values are here, then the value is gonna be very high and it could trigger the next neuron, right? If the bias were low, if it were zero or even set to a negative value, then no matter what these inputs are, then it can, it's like a threshold. And it's sort of like, no matter, it sort of overrides this and it can make it very, very low and not influence the next neuron. So the bias, that's why it's called the bias instead of the y-intercept. The bias implies that it affects the threshold sort of, like in biological firing, where uh, it's more or less likely to fire the next neuron. That bias can, if the neural network sets it very high, it might give more importance to this neuron as a unit. And if it gives a very low value of the bias, it, that neural network might give a very low value or importance to that. Now, why would that matter? If you have a very complicated neural network looking at edge detection, then certain neurons that are tuned to the edges, and by the, by the way, an edge might be looking at the contrast difference in the pixel values along a line, right? If that particular attribute, a, a line, is very important to whatever it is you're trying to detect, then it might give a very high bias. For instance, a stop sign has that octagonal shape, it has very flat edges. So I would imagine the neurons that are in that neural net somewhere have to be looking for edges, and they're probably gonna be weighted very high with a high bias because they're important for detecting the edge of the stop sign. Now I'm telling you this as if I know this, but I don't really know this, nobody does, because these neural networks have, have many cases, billions of parameters, and we can't understand exactly how they function. But we do know in general, that biological systems do have edge detection and they have movement detection. And those things have been done by evolution. And we know that artificial neural networks can have the same sort of thing. I'm just giving you a motivation as to why they have this along with the separate bias term that can be twisted and turned, so to speak. It gives the network the latitude to give certain neurons with, that are processing certain things more or less weight. Maybe movement is really important for detecting to get out of the way of a car. We all have uh, movement detection in our, uh, in our brains, basically, and that helps us react very quickly. And neurons fire when things move. You see it. That is happening because we have certain neurons that don't care about anything except if something's moving. Then they fire, and then they get our attention, right? And they might have a very high bias to do that, to cause some other additional neurons to fire and process that information. So the knobs in this equation are all of the coefficients here. These are all of the weights, right? and they can all be turned. And then we have these as well. 
Now, notice that you have all of these weights and biases. That's a lot of weights and biases, and a lot of knobs that can be turned. But then we also have, for this knob, different weights and a bias. For this neuron, different weights and a bias. For this no knob, different weights and a bias. If you go back to real neural networks with thousands of inputs, you can very quickly get to hundreds of millions or even billions or hundreds of billions of combinations of parameters. In other words, there's so many variations in how things can be tuned, a human could never do it. You have to figure out a way to train it to get better, and we're going to get to that in just a second. Now, before I go any farther, this is the, the meat of this lesson. Understanding that the neuron values are basically a linear combination, and we can tune these knobs and make it better at what it does. But when you read about neural networks, especially research, you always see all of these neural networks written as a matrix, you know, the square brackets and matrix. You learn about matrices in high school. It's never taught with any kind of importance because people, you know, this is hard to teach a high school student or even a college student why matrices are very important. But these equations can be written very compactly in terms of matrices. So I'm just, even if you don't, you know, care, I'm going to write it down so you can see it so that you can understand where it comes from. What you do is you take all of these, I think I'm going to underline them. I'm going to underline them in this color. I'm going to underline all of these values just to make it easy. These are the important values for the network uh, because they govern the relative weights uh, in the connections there. And so what you can do is you can make a, 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 ma a matrix like this. You can make a matrix of these values. So you could say 1, 3, 2, I'm reading right here, 5, 2. Right? And then on the next line, you can write, read the next weights here. It'll be 0, 1, 1, 2, 6. 0, 1, 1, 2, 6. And then 2, 6, 0, 1, 1. So 2, 6, 0, 1, 1, and close your matrix off. All right? And um, let me just double check here. 1, 3, 2, 5, 2, 0, 1, 1, 2, 6, and then 2, 6, 0, 1, 1. Now, what we can do is go back into the recesses of your mind and remember something called matrix multiplication. If this is a matrix, I can write the variables I'm multiplying by as a column matrix like this. It'll be x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. Now, I do have more to say, but I'm going to stop here and we're going to talk about it. For those of you who remember how to multiply matrices, it's going to be very simple. If what I'm about to say confuses you, that's okay. I have entire classes in, in essentially a matrix arithmetic. When you have a matrix of numbers multiplied by, in this case, uh, a matrix of variables, here's how you multiply them. You put your finger on the first row and you go across and then down. And then once you're done with that, you go to the next row, across and then down. And then you go to the next row and you go across and then down. And then the way, what you're doing as you interact with the elements is you're multiplying everything and you're adding. So it's one times this, then three times this, then two times this, then five times this, then two times this. And the results are always added together. And that's exactly recovering what this equation is. One times x, that comes from here. Three times this is here. Two times x, uh, the number three and then the five, and then the two come from here. Then you go to the next row. Zero times this, here it is. One times this, here it is. One times this, here it is. Two times this, here it is. Six times this one, here it is. You always go over and down. Finally, over and down. Two times this is this. Six times this is this. Zero times this is this. One times this is this. One times this is this. Over and down, over and down, over and down. Always repeat, over and down, over and down, to multiply matrices together. Now, what this is going to do is return a column of values. But we do have to still add the biases. So what I have here is I then add to the result of this multiplication, because notice I have an addition sign here, I have to add to that the, uh, the uh, biases, right? Which are B1, B2, and B3, right? And then what is that equal to? That is equal to, over here, uh, the output of neuron 1, neuron 2, neuron 3. Sorry it's so close to the board here. You get the idea. So 
What you do to write this thing as a matrix equation is you multiply the coefficient matrix of all of the weights there times the input neurons that you have. This generates a column of uh, 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 values, essentially, uh, of three values, because it's over and down, that's one value, over and down, that's another value, over and down, it's a third value. Then when you get that, you add it to the to the biases, you, first value gets added to this one, second value, after you do the multiplication, second value to this one, third value to this one, and the result is the output or the value stored in neuron one, neuron two, neuron three. Notice I labeled this one neuron one, neuron two, and then the other one is neuron three. In any literature with neural networks, this is what you're gonna see. You're gonna see all these brackets, uh, and in fact, it's gonna be harder to understand because you're, gonna, you're not gonna see numbers. You're just gonna see um, you know, more and more variables everywhere. In fact, I'll, I'll write it down for you here in just a second. But I wanted to show you that something as understandable as a bunch of lines, essentially very complicated sort of lines, sort of, sort of, sort of mathematical objects, can be written as a matrix. Now, this is the way I like to motivate it with numbers so that everybody can understand it. If you were really looking in the literature, then what you would really see is something like this. You would see a matrix here, and this matrix will be full of weights. Weight, zero comma zero. Weight, zero comma one, dot, dot, dot. Weight, one comma zero. Uh, weight, one comma one dot, 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 and then you have dot, dot, dot down here, and dot, dot, dot down here, and this would make the weight matrix. See, I put numbers here to make it easy to understand, but this is what you would see in the literature. These are just the different weights that are the connections between the neurons. And then over here, you would see, instead of x1 and x2, that I, I use that because I it's just more comfortable for me coming from math, but in neural networks, you would typically see a0, like parentheses zero, or a1, parentheses zero, like this. And this notation means, instead of the x values as the, as the uh, inputs, these are uh, the first in, uh, input value, the second input value. Now here's the thing I gotta fess up to. In computer programming, when we start counting, we always start with zero. But when I wrote my equations, I, I started counting from the number one because it's more natural to me. So when you see zeros everywhere, because this is like the first neuron, the second neuron or the first input value, the second input value. In other words, these A values are the input values replacing X1 through five. It's like A0, A1, A2, A3. It's just a relabeling here. And then you add to that the biases, B0 and B1, dot, dot, dot. And then all of that stuff is gonna equal, instead of calling it neuron N1 and N2, they will write it as something like this, A0 parentheses one, A0 parentheses two and so on, dot, dot, dot. What does this mean? The number in parentheses is the layer. So what this is saying is this calculation gives you output values with parentheses, uh, whoops, I, that's a mistake. There shouldn't be a two there. Apologize for that, it should be a one. Uh, and this is the, sort of the next layer over. So what it's saying is, and I made another mistake, I apologize. This should be one, one like this. This is saying the, the, the next layer over value zero, value one. Next layer over, value zero, value one, value two. All it's telling you, I labeled them N1, N2, neuron one, neuron two to make it easier. But typically it'll be, uh, this will be uh, the first, the zeroth layer, this will be the first layer. In parentheses, it's telling you what layer you're at and then which element of that, uh, of that layer you are. So you go read them down here. Over here, it's the zeroth layer. This is the input here. So this is the inputs to the neural network, the zeroth layer, first L pixel, second pixel, third pixel, you know, first bias, second bias, third bias, and then the connection weights are there as well. So you see what I mean? When you look at this, even though I know what it says, I get confused. I'm like, wow, that's really complicated. That's why I didn't start out by writing down a very mathematical looking thing. What I'd rather you do is forget about this and understand conceptually what's going on. Every neural network has input layer input values, and there's connection weights to the next layer. Every neuron has different connection weights, like these are different than the other neuron above. All you're doing to calculate the value of this neuron right here is multiplying and adding, and then adding a bias. Multiplying all the inputs times different weights, and then adding a bias. Multiplying by different weights, adding a different bias. Multiplying by different weights, and adding a yet a different bias. And then all of that just gives you the values at this layer, these neurons. Then, to calculate these neurons, you have to do it again. This neuron depends on these with different weights that I haven't written down here. So this is gonna be 
this value, whatever it was calculated to be, right, times some weight, this times some weight, this times some weight, then you add a bias, that value gets stored right here, right? Same thing here. This is going to be multiplied. There's some connection here, there's some connection here, and there's some connection here. It's multiplied by a weight, multiplied by a different weight, multiplied by another different weight. Add it together, then add a bias. This is a value stored here. Same thing here, and then with the same thing here. This is, depends on this, this, and this with different weights, and finally you get down to an output value. Now you have so many connections at every layer that it can often get into the hundreds of millions or even higher different numbers of connections, lots of different knobs to tune the network. So let me go over my notes and make sure I didn't forget anything. I talked about how uh, computer programming starts counting from zero. I counted from one because I just found it easier. So if you see zeros, that's why that's there. Uh, other neurons follow from this calculation. We just talked about that. Every layer is calculated from the previous layer and another bias is added to it. And then the whole thing continues downstream, however many levels there are. Now I left some things out of this lesson. Uh, for those of you expert in neural networks, you, you know I left a lot out, okay? I did that because I intentionally wanted to make it simple enough to understand. The things that I, I think I left the, the guts of it there. I think I left the most important things in. But the things I left out are, for example, when I look at input values like pixel values and multiply by some weights, then I can get literally any value here uh, for, for the neuron. Because the pixel values can be anything, the weights can be anything, they can even be negative. And so this can be really anything. But in real neural networks, every time a calculation is done, after this calculation is performed, whatever the value that you get from that is usually, it's usually run through another function to kind of like, to make it well behaved. In other words, instead of having values from negative infinity to positive infinity for like every neuron, what we do is we run it through often what we call a sigmoid function, which uh, basically changes it from, instead of negative infinity to positive infinity, it changes it to go from zero to one. You know, in computers, operating between zero and one is extremely, uh, uh, makes it very, very easy to work with everything. So if all of these neurons can have any value, let's, let's say this value is 57. And then the value in this neuron, when you calculate it, is like 42. And the value of this neuron is negative three. Then what you do is you, you run it through the sigmoid function, which changes it so that every neuron only gives you an output between zero and one. It changes the wide range that you can calculate into a zero to one range. Now, a sigmoid function is one of the ways that, we, that it's done, but there are other functions that are uh, often being invented all the time to try to make neural networks behave. Uh, there, there's other ones. I don't even want to mention what they all are because it's kind of beyond the scope of this class. Just know that after you calculate the value of a neuron, it's often run through some sort of processing to change the range of it. It still retains the meaning. Higher, uh, it just change, higher or lower, it just changes the, the range to make it more well-behaved for a computer. All right. Also, I left out network architecture. This is a very simple network to help you understand, but there, there are other types of, of networks out there that are, I don't even want to get into them because it's beyond the scope of this lesson, but there are other architectures out there that are not covered in this lesson because this is just an introductory lesson. It's a good springboard. Just know that there are other architectures that would differ slightly from this. All right, uh, talked about the number of parameters, easy to, easy to get to hundreds of millions or billions of parameters. And now we need to come to the very last part of this video. I'm not gonna do, uh, uh, cover everything here because it really requires its own video. How do we train this neural network? How do we train it? That is the thing. We've established that this neural network has lots and lots of knobs, right? And the knobs are able to be turned. And you can see how many knobs there are because you multiply the number of combinations to, down, down each level and you can get to very high number of combinations of knobs because you have the connection weights but you have the biases that are added at each level as well, right? Um, but how, how do we tell it or how do we adjust the weights in such a way to get closer and closer to truth? Like when I show it a car, I want it to have a high value for a car, for instance. How do I make it do better and better? Initially, the network is in randomly has random weights and it performs terribly. And then as you train it, it gets better and better and better. How is that done? So what typically is done is you have to define what's called a loss function for the network. In other words, an error function. You have to define how to tell the computer when it's wrong, mathematically when it's wrong. Not just like, oh, it was wrong, yes or no. How wrong were you? And also a mechanism to feed that back. It's usually called back propagation 
to ripple back through and change the weights to try to make the error function smaller and smaller. You want the error or the, or the loss function to be small. All I'm going to do in this lesson is to give you kind of an analogy. Okay. Um, first, talk about the loss function or the, or the uh, error function, and uh, then we'll go from there. So in order to tell the network if it's doing bad, you usually define something called a loss function. Right? And usually it's equal to uh, the truth of what you want the network to output minus the actual, the actual outcome. And then you, you subtract them and you see how far away it was from truth. Uh, and then you square it. Now what do I mean by truth and actual? If you look at this one over here, um, I think it's actually over here. We were feeding pictures into here and we were getting outputs. And in this case, the car was really only 0.95. The highest value it could be is one, let's say. Um, so it's really not perfect. The there is a uh, error associated with it. Why wasn't it 99? Or, or why isn't it 1.0, right? Um, but then also these were giving value. So what you want is you want this to be high and you want these to be small. So what you do is you define a loss function that basically, uh, if you feed it a car, then the car should be a one and the tree should be a zero and the cat should be a zero. That's perfection. So what you do is you, you uh, sum all the outputs. The, uh, uh, the car will be one minus whatever actual value I got, which was actually 0.95 in this case. And then you would have the, the uh, cat should be zero. You want the truth for the cat to be zero and then you have an actual value for the cat, and then you want the tree to be zero, and, the, and you have an actual value there, and you subtract them all. In other words, if these were the values I actually got out of the network, the truth values would be like one, zero, zero. So you'd say one minus this, that gives you a very small number, one minus, uh, then zero minus this, because you want truth to be zero, zero minus this, that gives you a small number, then zero minus this. And the reason that you square them is because um, just in case the network outputs something higher or lower than truth, you want, it, you want to operate on a positive number. So you do a subtraction from truth to what it gave you, and then you square the result. And you say, and you add them all up. So if there's five outputs, you would add them all up. And then you arrive at one single number that tells you how bad does this network perform, right? And then from that, that's called the loss function or the error function for that network. And what you try to do is you have algorithms, we have algorithms that have been developed, new algorithms coming out all the time to try to turn the right knobs in this mess of a neural network. All the, of all the knobs in here, which one do I turn? Do I turn this one? Do I turn this one? This one? Or maybe I have to turn a hundred of them, right? Uh, to get any better, to try to make that loss function smaller and smaller. So the bottom line to train it is you define a loss function. You define a way of taking the true value for whatever input you have that you want it to be, and you subtract what the network gave you. And you do it for all the outputs, what the truth is of what you want and then what it gave you, what you want and what it gave you. And then you square them and you add them and that's called a loss function. And then you have to turn the parameters in such a way to try to get that loss function smaller and smaller. Now, I'm leaving a lot out because it's a whole area, active area of research to even do that and to do it intelligently. Because don't forget, there could be millions of knobs. How do you know which ones to turn? Well, there are ways in calculus to figure out which knobs to turn. It has to do with figuring out the gradient or the derivative, which of the knobs is going to give you the greatest change in the error function or the loss function. Remember from calculus, you when you take the derivative of something, it tells you how fast something is changing. But in this case, you have you have maybe a million knobs to turn. How do you figure it out? So you have to figure out which knobs are going to give you the biggest change and in the correct direction. And then when you then you give that knob a tiny little turn. And then you recalculate the network again and do the whole thing again. And then you do it again and again with more and more data, turning the knobs each time a tiny bit in the correct direction to get to the lowest loss function you can get to. So what would that look like? Just for giggles, what would that look like? Well, here is just a cartoon because the real neural network is much more complicated than this. Let's say that the loss function looks something like this. It's like this and then like, like this. So this is the loss function, right? And I, I'm drawing it like this, but this is kind of misleading because this is like an XY graph, but in reality, the neural network has like a million knobs you can turn. 
not just one knob, not like one X value, it's like a million knobs. You could go a million different directions. So it's much more complicated, but you get the idea here. So let's say you, you calculated the loss function and the neural network was giving you a loss about right here. Then you calculate based on which ones are in error and uh, again, using calculus and I'm not gonna go through in this class, trying to calculate the derivative or the gradient and figure out which knobs are gonna give you the most change in the loss function. And then you turn those knobs just a little bit and then you recalculate the loss function and then you suddenly move down here. And you do it again and again and again and then maybe you overshoot and then so you end up settling down here. Literally, you're tuning the knobs in such a way to make the loss or the error between the truth and the actual smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually you really can't get it any smaller than this because it's just kind of like in this well down here. This is the best possible way that the network can perform. All right, now you do have to be careful because what happens if you start over here in the loss uh, function? And then you end up down here and settling into a local minima, and so then you can't really get out of it. Because as you turn any of the knobs, it's just gonna make a higher loss function, and you turn the knobs this way is a higher loss function, so you're gonna, the computer's gonna settle into here. Then the network is operating at a pr relatively high loss when you really want the neural network to operate way down here. So that is a real challenge in, uh, in algorithms, really. How do you figure out what knobs to turn? How do you know which way to turn them? And how do you know that you're actually in an absolute minimum of a loss function so the network is operating the best it can. Maybe there's another local minimum somewhere else because again, this is a simple cartoon with only one knob, the X value here. In reality, there's a million knobs and there's like a million dimensions. You can think of each knob as a dimension. All the weights and biases multiplied together essentially to affect how that network is gonna perform. So that's a very active area of research. That's as far as I'm gonna go into it because there are new algorithms being developed all the time to figure out how to adjust the weights and biases in the best, most efficient way because I also haven't talked at all about uh, the big elephant in the room and that is that we want these neural networks to operate on computers we can hold in our hand or in our car. We don't want them to operate on supercomputers. So we have to optimize the neural networks to be able to function on these small devices that we have. That's a whole other can of worms that is not covered at all. That is about the best I can do for an introduction and overview of machine learning and neural networks. I said in the beginning that it was just an introduction and it was just an overview because that's all that can be done in one lesson. And also I'm not an active researcher in this field. I feel like I understand enough of it to teach it, but I'm not in, in, in the cutting bleeding edge of research. There are new algorithms coming out literally monthly uh, on different ways to optimize certain aspects of this problem. It's not something that's gonna be solved overnight, but it is extremely uh, robust uh, technique and procedure that has achieved really remarkable results. When I was younger, we couldn't talk to computers and get answers. Computers couldn't speak with synthesized speech. And self-driving was not a thing at all. Image recognition, it was difficult. It was a big challenge for a long time to get a computer to recognize a picture of a cat because it's a very difficult problem. Now we can do those things. The computers can do those things using these methods. We went over the applications of neural networks and machine learning, what the difference between AI and ML and machine and, and neural networks are, how they're inspired by biology, but really not a direct copy of biological systems. And if there's one thing that I want you to get out of this whole lesson, honestly, it would probably be this because once you realize that it's just like a line or a function of, uh, of the equation of a line in algebra, um, that each of these neurons just multiply times a weight and then add some y-intercept bias. The only difference is that because they have more than one input, then the calculation for that neuron, it involves multiple slopes with input, sort of. Like each one of these is like a slope, sort of a knob to turn, and then you have that y-intercept. Once you make that connection, that it's just the equation of a line expanded to something bigger than that with more dimensions, then you can wrap your brain around how it's working. Now, that's about all I can say for now. I encourage you to follow along. Maybe I'll do another one of these in the future. Let me know if you enjoyed it, if you want to see more. And uh, you know, follow me on into following the research here. I think this field is going to absolutely explode over the next five, 10, 15 years. So I look forward to following it with you. Please drop me a line. Let me know what you think. Follow me on to the next lesson.